Um, well, thank you for that kind introduction, and I'm, I'm thrilled to be here at, at UMass Dartmouth. Um, my organization, Spark, is based in Washington, D.C., um, but I actually split my time between there and my home in Providence, Rhode Island. Um, so UMass Dartmouth is actually very close to where I live, and I visited this campus a number of times, and it's just a thrill to be here speaking with you on the issue uh, that's so important to me in my work. Um, so thank you once again for the invitation. Um, so my goal here today is to provide some background on what's happening across the country on the issue of textbook affordability. It's obviously an issue here on campus. But to provide some background um, on what the issues are, why it's happening, and then specifically what we can do in, in terms of solving the problem in the long term and the specific solution that I'm going to be focusing on is open educational resources, which, which many of you have heard of. Um, so I'd just like to note first that all of the slides that I have here uh, are available online at SlideShare and will also be distributed uh, afterwards. They're under an open license, so you can feel free to use them if you find them helpful. Um, and I also have links and citations put in the notes of the slides if you're wondering about uh, or you want to follow up on any of the projects that I mention. So just to start out, we're all here because higher education is important, uh, especially for uh, young people in America, um, making sure that we're educating the next generation of leaders and contributors to our economy and society. Uh, and a college degree has become increasingly necessary these days uh, in order to get good jobs. Uh, but unfortunately, higher education has also become synonymous with expensive. Uh, students are taking on more and more debt to be able to afford higher education, which makes them delay major decisions like getting married or buying houses. In fact, collectively as Americans, we hold over $1 trillion in student debt. And, and not just that, last year alone, uh, the federal government gave away um, uh, over $60 billion in direct uh, aid to students to pay for higher education in the form of grants and work study and also gave away uh, nearly 100 billion in student loans. So we as a society are investing heavily in higher education, uh, but uh, everybody recognizes how expensive uh, it really has become, even at public institutions. So the question is, what can we really do about it? Uh, breaking down the different cost factors, we have tuition and fees, which get the most uh, attention in the college affordability debate. Um, but reducing that means what? Reducing programs on campus, reducing salaries, uh, coming up with other funding to the state to be able to fund the institution. There are tough, tough questions around how to address tuition and fees. Similarly with room and board, uh, the cost of living expenses, especially around campuses as they become larger and larger, has become an issue for students. Transportation to campus in order to attend class. Again, tough questions to address those expenses. But there's this category of books and supplies when you look at um, the way that the overall student budget breaks down, where there's actually an opportunity to make a significant difference. Uh, because these costs are primarily borne by students directly, so they're not part of the bottom line of the institution. And at the same time, um, there are many different alternatives out there uh, to, to use um, in, instead of the really, really expensive materials that are out there. So even though books and supplies, the light blue stripe over there is a small part of this overall cost, uh, this expense is actually really, really significant, disproportionately si significant for students because it tends to come uh, after all of the other expenses that students take. Uh, so it's after they've paid for tuition and housing and all of that. Um, it's also uh, an, typically an out-of-pocket expense if, if student aid doesn't stretch that far. So students have like the visceral experience of having to uh, spend several hundred dollars uh, on their books every semester. Uh, and in many cases, it can end up being the straw that, that breaks the camel's back. Uh, I remember when I was in a, a college student, I went to a private institution, tuition was $40,000 a year, and I still balked at paying $200 for a textbook. Uh, and there were cases where I didn't buy the book because it was too expensive, just because I wasn't willing to pay that much. And it's wrong uh, to put students in that kind of a position. So as we all know, textbook prices have been rising, uh, rising in, incredibly rapidly, uh, about 82% uh, in, in the past decade. And that's about three times the rate of inflation, just under the, the pace of tuition and fees. Um, 
And just to give you one example close to home, this is a, a calculus textbook, one of the most popular calculus textbooks in the country, actually. There's over a half a million students uh, enrolled in courses, or yeah, half a million students enrolled in, in courses using this book every year. Um, and it's actually, it's used here at UMass Dartmouth. I don't mean to single anybody out. There are a ton of courses with books like this. Um, so does anybody want to guess like, how much this book costs uh, here at UMass Dartmouth? And I, and I hope anybody who assigns this is not in the audience. And if you are, I'm not trying to pick on you. So any guesses? 200. Any other guesses? OK. Yeah, no, it's 323.50. <coughs> Um, but I will note that it does come with uh, uh, a, a, a EWA, which is probably a passcode uh, online supplement uh, and an ebook uh, that probably expire at the end of the semester. So you may notice that there's no option to buy this book used at the bookstore, and that's probably because those materials expire at the end of the semester and the student isn't able to resell the book. So this is $323 that the student has to spend and cannot get any of that back, whether they want to keep the book or not. So this is an unusual. This happens all across the country. This is a set of uh, 10 high enrollment courses that have uh, an average price of $175 uh, for the top market leading books. Um, and you know, it's not a surprise that we're starting to see trends like Two out of every three students now say that they have skipped buying one of their textbooks because the cost is too high. Uh, about half of students say they have at some point taken fewer courses because the textbook costs are too high. Uh, many more students are saying they're dropping courses, they're withdrawing from courses, they're doing worse in courses because the cost is too high. Um, and uh, one particularly alarming note is that less than half students, half of students now say that they buy the newest version of the textbook. So about half the students in your courses, uh, statistically speaking, uh, probably have the current edition of the book and the rest of them have an older edition uh, that they've bought online for cheaper and are trying to follow along uh, with the different page numbers and different workbook questions. Uh, or maybe they've copied a book from a friend. Uh, uh, maybe they're relying on a library reserve copy if there's one available. Uh, maybe they just didn't buy the book. Uh, or maybe they went online and searched for uh, a PDF copy that um, uh, uh, is unauthorized. So at the end of the day, the important point is that students can't learn from materials they can't afford. So think about the book you're assigning, and uh, the question really is, can students afford to access it? Because they need to do that in order to be able to learn from it. And of course, we all know there are many options out there that students can use to save. Uh, renting, used books, uh, international editions are increasingly common. Uh, and we're seeing a lot of uh, e-book versions of textbooks coming out now, too. Uh, that are sold at about half the price of a printed book. Just to give you one example, this is a physics textbook. Um, so it's $103, but just one interesting trend we're observing is that uh, you see how you don't have the option to buy this digital book. It's 180 days of access for $103. And of course, that's better than the regular price of $260. But this is intro physics. At most campuses, this is a three semester course two or three semester course. So how many semesters can you fit into 180 days? Less than two. So at the end of the day, this kind of solution um, is, is actually setting up students to maybe not have access to their book, potentially pay more than they would have had otherwise. And the message that it's sending is essentially this. You better read the book quickly because that, it's going to disappear. <laughs> so, um, uh, and we've seen study after study, the, the kind of digital solutions that are out there, we know that there's the potential for it to be better. Uh, but we're finding that this kind of model, um, uh, students aren't being as engaged with it. Uh, study after study have kind of found that students really aren't engaged with e-textbooks just by, by the virtue of them being digital. Uh, you know, s look at the environment that students are in right now. It's interactive, it's social, it's, it's uh, live. Uh, but when you give them a, a basically a PDF of a book, uh, uh, it doesn't add the kind of value that they're looking for from the digital environment. 
So the underlying uh, kind of problem here that's led to all of these different factors I've just discussed is that the course material market uh, is broken. It doesn't operate like a normal consumer market in, in the way that, that it should. Uh, and that's because uh, the way it's set up is, is unusual uh, for, for economic markets. There's kind of a three-way system here. Uh, where faculty members are, are the decision makers in the market and yet students are the ones that actually have to pay for the material. And of course this is the way it needs to be set up because faculty are the people who are qualified to decide uh, what their students need to learn. Uh, but it creates a dynamic where once a book has been assigned, the publisher of that book essentially has a monopoly. And they can set prices pretty much however high they want. And students still need to buy them. And that's what's resulted in textbooks costing over $300 for introductory calculus, where the core material uh, is well established and has been for several centuries. Um, and uh, uh, what compounds this situation is that the market is, is dominated by just a few companies. Uh, about 90% of the market is controlled by just five publishing companies. Uh, who generally don't compete with each other on price, right? Because the consumers, the people that are buying the material, uh, don't have any say in what's been assigned to them. Uh, so that's really removed any price pressure that could keep prices under control. So it's essentially been a free-for-all, and that's why we saw this graph of prices rising three times the rate of inflation. But one other indication of how, how uh, broken this market is is that there have been several studies recently that have shown that even though textbook prices are going up, student spending on textbooks is going down. So there are a number of different factors that feed into this. So obviously students have better access to renting. You see the one in the middle is, is one of the lowest, and that was the year that textbook renting became widespread uh, at college bookstores. Uh, so that's helping, of course. Uh, but at the end of the day, uh, what this trend signals is that there are a lot of students opting out. They're not buying the book, they're opting to access the book in an unauthorized way. Uh, so there are lots of pressures in this market and the question is where is it going? It's going to change and the question is what is it going to look like when it transforms? And uh, where SPARC comes to this uh, as a, a coalition of academic and research libraries, we want to make sure that we're effectively using the digital environment to be able to expand access to materials, uh, to lower costs, and actually enable the next uh, generation of teaching and learning practices. So in today's world, we can do better. And that's why we advocate for the model of, of open educational resources. So how many of you are familiar with this term? Awesome. Uh, anybody using open educational resources in your course? Okay, awesome. Awesome, cool. Um, so I'm gonna run through the basics uh, of, of what open educational resources are. Um, so generally, uh, the definition we use uh, is, is founded for this term. I know it's a little bit of a wonky term, open educational resources, but it's a term of art uh, coined by UNESCO, uh, the UN organization, and it's defined as uh, teaching, learning, and research resources that reside in the public domain uh, or have been released under an open copyright license that permits their free use and repurposing by others. Uh, so basically, any type of educational material, video, textbooks, lecture notes, whatever, uh, that have these two qualities. So the first is that they're free, free of cost, free of barriers, and typically distributed online, uh, but can come in many other formats like print or PDF at the same time. And the second part is this idea of permissions. Uh, so either no copyright or the person who holds the copyright has released it so that um, uh, everybody has advanced permission to use it in a set of ways. Uh, and typically when we're talking about open educational resources, we use a framework uh, for divining what the uses are, and we call them the five R's. Uh, so the five R's are the right to retain, meaning that you can always keep and control a copy of it. So a library can archive uh, a, a digital or a print copy of the book. Um, 
uh, without gaining extra permission. Uh, the right to reuse, meaning you can take it and use it in, in your course, or you can learn it, uh, use it in a, a training program. Uh, you can take it and put it on your website. You can uh, use it in any way that you want. Uh, the idea of revising and remixing, uh, those refer to uh, taking a copy of it, um, an educational resource, say an open textbook, and actually going in and editing that copy. Uh, so taking out the material you don't want to cover, adding in examples that are more locally relevant, or adding in material that, that uh, uh, you've written yourself. Uh, and actually combining different open educational resources into a new resource that you can distribute to your students. And then the final R is the right to redistribute. So you have advanced permission to uh, share this material with your students. You can share it with the public. You can share it with a worldwide audience. And you don't need to worry about copyright restrictions holding you back. Um, and if you want to learn more about the origin of this framework uh, or what it means, you can visit opencontent.org. So this idea of open licensing uh, is important to keep in mind uh, because it's what grants those permissions. And it's kind of like an all, uh, taking an all rights reserved copyright and making it some rights reserved. Uh, so it essentially uses the copyright to enable free and open sharing while still sure, ensuring the author can be attributed for the work. And there's a scheme of licensing called Creative Commons. It's a nonprofit organization that's developed a set of really easy to use licenses that allow you to determine um, how many permissions you want to grant and what you want them to look like. Um, and they have a set of six licenses that you can go and check out at creativecommons.org. Uh, and generally, most of them are considered open educational resources when you use them. So let's take a look at what the OER market looks like right now. How is it being used? How is it being created? Uh, and what are some of the impacts on campus? So the question that I get from a lot of people is just, you know, who writes this stuff? Who would write a textbook and how, a free textbook and how are they compensated? So many of you may be familiar with the idea of MIT's open courseware program. Uh, so this was launched uh, back in the early 2000s. And the idea was MIT uh, is a world-class institution, and yet the professors on that campus were only teaching, um, in the context of world, a handful of students every year. Uh, yet the teaching materials that they produced uh, could help educate uh, many people. So they set up a program where professors could actually take their teaching materials and post them online under an open license for the entire world to access and use. Uh, and since they're creating them anyway uh, for their own students, uh, they had the option to share them. Uh, and so far, uh, over 125 million people across the world have used these materials. And one of the things that I find really interesting is about um, uh, another 50% uh, of, of those on top of that, um, so another about 70 million people, have uh, used translations of these materials. They've been translated into six languages. So the fact that these, these materials were le released under an open license that permitted others to go in and improve and, and uh, translate uh, and, and localize the materials has actually expanded their potential audience um, and helped educate uh, people across the world. So there are a few other campuses, uh, actually over 200 institutions, that have this kind of program uh, one of my favorite examples is the University of Michigan, their medical school, is actually developing resources for their first and second year medical curriculum and putting them online. And uh, uh, they're actually working with a partner organization in Africa called OER Africa that is uh, uh, taking the materials that Open Michigan has developed and put under an open license and localizing them to Africa where there are di different diseases that uh, 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 medical professionals are focusing on, where they're predominantly dealing with black skin, where a disease will present differently. So there needs to be different information to um, uh, uh, be locally relevant. So I think it's a really great example of the power that open educational resources hold. So in addition to these open courseware programs, there are also a number of repositories that are available on the website run by nonprofits and institutions where individuals with expertise can go and post re educational resources they've created under an open license. One example is oercommons.org, and another based at Rice University is called connections.org. 
and uh, you can go to these websites and search for materials. Uh, both actually have uh, special software built in that actually enable you to adapt the materials if the license gives you permission to do that. Uh, and create collections of materials that you could potentially assign to students in a course. And then uh, what this uh, Rice University's open repository uh, a few years ago kind of recognized that just providing a great wealth of materials is great, uh, but they're not that e easy to just sort of take and use in your classroom without doing a lot of work to go and search and find them. So they expanded their project to publish a set of open textbooks that can actually compete directly with uh, traditionally published commercial textbooks. So they're building out textbooks in the uh, 20 highest enrolled college courses across the country, like intro physics, sociology, biology. And uh, these books uh, are developed by teams of faculty who receive upfront uh, payments for their work instead of receiving royalties on uh, the, the end side, they're receiving payment up front for their work and then the books are released under an open license for anyone anywhere in the world to use. And they're developed with all of the different supplements that traditional published textbooks would come with, like uh, uh, test banks and, and workbooks and homework software. Uh, some of it is supported by uh, uh, actually supplements that students will pay for. Uh, at a much lower cost than they would from a traditional uh, publisher, and that creates a sustainable model where they're able to sustain and improve the books through the future. And one thing that I find really remarkable uh, is that their physics textbook, it was launched about two years ago, and it has already gained over 5% of the intro physics market. So in the context of textbook publishing, writing a new textbook and getting 5% of the market in, in two years is, is absolutely unheard of and remarkable. So that speaks to the quality of the books and then also just the demand out there for affordable alternatives. So university presses are actually getting involved in this space too of open textbook publishing. The Oregon State University Press uh, partnered with their library and extended campus to publish a set of open textbooks uh, working with faculty on their campus to showcase uh, the particular expertise uh, in, in subjects that they have at Oregon State. Uh, which is a really interesting model. The, the institution provides a budget transfer to the faculty who write these books, and the university press handles the editing and peer review process, and uh, the libraries and extended campus are helping to develop digital versions of the textbooks that can be widely used. And at the University of Minnesota, with all of these different projects out there that are developing open textbooks, they've actually created an online library where uh, they've gone through and, and done preliminary, preliminary, preliminary quality reviews of these textbooks and posted them in a catalog that you can actually go and search. So if you're looking for an open textbook in your course, this is a good place to start. Uh, the website's open.umn.edu. And uh, they've worked with faculty members across the country to actually write reviews of the bo books. So for many of them, you can actually get a sense of what another faculty member has thought of it. And then moving beyond just the idea of textbooks, uh, there are a number of institutions that have moved into courses. Uh, so I'm sure that many of you have heard the term MOOCs, uh, Massive Open Online Courses. So that was a trend a couple of years ago, uh, and the idea behind it is actually very similar to open educational resources. Why uh, uh, create a material that you're just going to use in your own classroom um, when you could actually open it up and, and share it with the entire world? Um, and while that trend uh, had its challenges, uh, the use of open licensing and free sharing of materials has actually uh, created uh, an, or led to a number of projects that have created online courses that do have the kind of usage uh, and completion rates that uh, I think the, the trend for MOOCs was hoping to achieve. And one example is at Carnegie Mellon University, their Open Learning Initiative. They've developed a set of uh, fully uh, uh, automated courses where students can go and take uh, a subject. It has all the course materials built in, and it's built with adaptive technology that actually learns as the student learns by providing assessments periodically within the subject matter. Uh, so it actually keeps track of what concepts students are getting, what students are missing, and uh, adjusts the future curriculum to be able to uh, reinforce the concepts to make sure that the student uh, actually learns them. 
And the data that this generates is enormously valuable and actually feeds directly into research happening at Carnegie Mellon on how to uh, uh, improve teaching and learning. It's a really interesting example. And then finally, there's a, a policy aspect in all of this. So we, as taxpayers, actually fund the development of a large number of educational resources through grants through, for example, the Department of Education, the Department of Labor, uh, the National Science Foundation, and there's been an increasing trend, and this is part of Spark's advocacy work uh, of, uh, that was started by the U.S. Department of Labor of putting uh, requirements on grants, saying that if you develop educational materials, these need to be openly licensed so that all Americans who paid for the development of these materials can actually freely use them and benefit from them. And uh, this particular program, which has possibly one of the worst acronyms that has ever been invented, um, we just say TACT. Um, uh, it's a $2 billion grant program to improve workforce training materials. And all of the materials that are coming out of this, this $2 billion investment, are being made available to the public in an online repository called skillscommons.org, where any institution across the country can take and build upon uh, the innovations produced by the, the excellent institutions involved in this grant program. So let's take a quick look at how some of these materials are being used. So most commonly, we talk about open textbooks. And the truth is, open textbooks can be used just like traditional textbooks, because it is a textbook. It just happens to have an open license on it. So you can take one of these books off the shelf. And actually, Marilyn, can you go into my backpack and pull the textbook out of it? Um, I actually brought a copy of an open textbook with me, um, and it's one of the smaller ones. Feel free to pass it around. Feel free to showcase it. <laughs> um, so you'll see it's full color. It, it looks just like any other traditional textbook, um, and uh, that's uh, uh, from the same series as the book up here from OpenStax. It's actually less expensive in print. Uh, but it's full color, it's free online, you can go to the website and read it now. You can get a PDF, you can get an EPUB, uh, and the print copies cost $30 to $40, um, sometimes $50, because this is like a thousand page book. Uh, and uh, the instructor, if, if you wish, can go in and take out the chapters you're not going to cover and have that printed up for students at a much lower cost, and you know the book can just be available at the bookstore like any other book. So uh, you don't have to change the way that you teach to use open educational resources, but of course there are many ways uh, that you can. Uh, and the impact on students is really enormous. So this is just one example of a professor who uh, has saved students, his students over a million dollars over the course of a few years by switching to open textbooks, which I think is really uh, amazing when you think about just adding up all the costs that students are paying each year for books. Another really interesting case is uh, a community college in Virginia called Tidewater. Uh, and this institution actually developed the nation's first two-year degree program that uses open educational resources in every single course. So they work closely with their faculty uh, to develop uh, uh, full sets of open educational resources for all of the business administration degree courses. And uh, at least one section uh, of the course each year uh, is using open educational resources <laughs> so students can literally get a degree without having to pay for textbooks. And at a community college, that cuts out potentially up to a third of what students are paying out of pocket. So the results of that are enormous. And what they're finding is that students are actually doing just as well in class, but more of them are actually completing the class with a C or better. Um, and more of them are, are uh, staying with the course and not dropping out, which has actually led to the institution retaining more money in tuition because they don't have to refund it to students. So seeing enormous benefits from this program there. And of course, that's at a two-year institution. It looks a little bit different when you're thinking about a four-year degree, four degree. But think about your gen ed curriculum. What if all of the gen ed courses had at least one section that was using open educational resources? So the students who really need access to affordable materials the most uh, can get to that, those courses without the, uh, 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 the hindrance of the cost. There have been cases where traditional publishers have actually picked up open educational resources that have been created to use them uh, to improve their materials. So this is a project out of uh, Colorado, University of Colorado, uh, where they developed a set of really high quality simulations for physics and chemistry. 
uh, and Pearson has actually used a bunch of these books in their digital or uh, these simulations in in their digital supplements for textbooks. So uh, it's it's a, a broad ecosystem, and there are lots of opportunities uh, uh, for this material to actually improve the overall uh, uh, corpus of educational materials. And finally, this is my favorite example of kind of the power of open educational resources. So this is an example of a graduate professor at uh, Brigham Young University teaching a course called Project Management for Instructional Designers. And that's a really, really narrow course. In fact, I don't think there's even a textbook that covers this. Uh, so what he did is he actually took a, an open textbook that was written for general project management and uh, assigned to his students to turn the textbook into project management for instructional design. And uh, instead of assigning students a set of essays that he, as a professor, would probably hate grading as, and students as students would uh, uh, not like so much writing and then probably throw away at the end of the semester, uh, he assigned them to contribute to a textbook that would educate future generations of students in this course. So thinking about their career as educators, uh, they have their name on this textbook as a contributor. Uh, future generations of this course have actually gone back and improved and critiqued the work of their previous, uh, their predecessors. So it's created a, a, essentially an ecosystem where students are able to engage in the thing they're learning, which is instructional design, uh, and come away with it having contributed something valuable uh, uh, to the educational space. So I just love this example because this is only possible in the open environment. It's not possible to do this kind of exercise uh, in a closed copyright environment. So I want to run through uh, just a, a couple of illustrations of what the benefits for students can be. Uh, so first of all, the savings are obvious. A uh, study was just done by the student PERGS, Mass PERG here. I, I know there's a chapter on campus. Um, a student save, they just did a report that found that students save an average of 128 per course when an, uh, an expensive traditional textbook is replaced with an open textbook. And if every student across the country had that happen for one of their courses each year, it would save $1.42 billion. That's the kind of money we're talking about. There have been cases for authors where writing an open textbook has literally transformed their career. Uh, this is uh, the woman on the left, Barbara Lowski. Uh, writing, she says that writing this open textbook uh, gave her visibility in a market where she would have had uh, no ability to compete if she had pu published it through a traditional textbook and introductory statistics course. Her book is used by hundreds of thousands of students across the world. Uh, it's received an award from the Texas and Academic Authors Association, uh, and she saves students uh, over $1 million at her institution alone by publishing this as an open textbook. Another illustration at Mercy College in New York, uh, their math faculty transitioned their developmental math course from expensive materials to open materials. And uh, developmental math is one of those, uh, you know, key gatekeeper courses that students often end up students uh, holding students back from advancing in their degrees because you have to get through your basic math requirements in order to get pretty much any degree, especially at community colleges, but often at four-year institutions too. And what they found is that um, uh, between two years of switching uh, from uh, the traditional materials, which cost about $200, to an open alternative, they observed a 12 percentage point increase in the number of students passing developmental math with a C or better. So there are a number of reasons that this could have been, uh, but the most likely one is that all of the students in the course had access to the materials they need starting day one. So there was no delaying, waiting for their financial aid check. Um, or uh, students not having the materials or not being able to turn in their homework because they couldn't access this, the homework system. And I've actually talked to a professor from this campus who said, it, it has changed the way I teach because I no longer have to wait two weeks to assume students have access to the materials because it, it usually takes about two weeks for the financial aid refund check to come in so students can buy their books. Uh, so 12 percentage point increase in developmental math with that many more students moving forward uh, in their degree programs. And then finally, I mentioned this a little bit before, uh, the idea of institutions actually getting 
a, a, a net benefit from open educational resources. There's a really, really neat tool uh, offered by a, a, a project called Lumen Learning. Uh, and the web address is up there, and it's a calculator that has taken a, a corpus of peer-reviewed research that's looked at the outcomes in courses using OER and uh, created a calculator when you can put in the number of students that in your course and uh, the average amount of the cost of your textbook and how many students typically graduate with a C or, or get through the course with a C or better, and it'll actually give you a bunch of different metrics including the increase in number of students who will probably get a C or better, uh, the amount of savings for the students, and uh, it'll actually also calculate, uh, uh, based on, on research at other institutions, the tuition revenue that'll be retained by the institution uh, because of students who don't drop. So uh, I think just taking a step back and thinking about open educational resources uh, there's a, a really big opportunity here to make sure that as the textbook market evolves that we're bringing it into the 21st century. And uh, uh, with, with textbook costs being that kind of sweet spot where it's, it's, really, it's a really big barrier for students in their education, but it's something that we can actually do something about right now. Uh, in a meaningful way, and, and you know, they're not open educational resources for every course, but there's a huge amount out there, uh, and making sure that, that faculty members have the support they need to go out um, and, and see if their alternatives can literally be transformative for students on this campus, and actually set things up so that teaching and learning pro uh, practices can evolve and take advantage of everything we have today. So uh, I, I think I'll stop there, and if we still have time, I'm, I'm happy to take uh, any questions from the audience. Oh. Well, when you, when you think about the market, how do you think about pressure of the international issue? Really interesting question. So there's a Supreme Court case uh, a couple of years ago that actually tested this, so whether it was a violation of copyright to take international editions of textbooks that were printed outside the U.S. for use in markets outside the U.S. and therefore priced for markets outside the U.S. and actually take, bring them back to the country and sell them here. Uh, and that Supreme Court case actually decided that it is legal to do that. Um, so I think it's, it's opened up uh, what was a gray market to be uh, a legitimate market. Uh, I don't know uh, that I've seen any specific uh, statistics on, on how it's impacting the publishers since that decision, uh, but it's certainly increased the number of online sellers that are actively uh, selling these books, but it, it has also had uh, an impact on, on the books that publishers are selling abroad. They've adapted their practices. so. If they do license a book for, for selling it abroad, uh, they will make more changes so that it's not quite as easy uh, to, to use it in place of the U.S. edition. I, I'm sorry, I didn't hear the question. Can you pass the microphone back? Uh, now I think there are some problems. So mm -hmm. maybe in some way, let me use a, co a copyright law. So the their textbook price are too high. So then I think the public or the government or some agents, so they can do something to make change of the copyright law. So to have students, so they only need to so find out other ways to make it less convenient for students. Mm -hmm. So I, I let me just make sure I understand that correctly. So uh, uh, changing copyright law uh, so that publishers would have to make these materials more openly available was that your question? So I think that uh, there's definitely a broader conversation around uh, updating copyright law so that it's, uh, it takes into account today's world. 
uh, because it was really designed uh, for the print-based world. And there are a lot of dynamics that appear when you have an industry like the traditional textbook publishing industry, whose business model was built on the idea of selling physical copies of books, and their new business model in the 21st century is built on the same principle except for using uh, digital rights management techniques that uh, enable them to sell copies of digital things in a world where the marginal cost of cre creating a copy is zero. Uh, so I think that uh, the role of copyright reform could certainly move things forward, uh, in, but it's an immensely politically charged topic and it's not an avenue that Spark has pursued. Uh, the, the way that we come at this is if the government is funding the development of educational materials, we should make sure that those materials are licensed to the public that paid for them, and I think that's a good first step, um, and it's something that we're looking at, not only in the educational materials front, but also in terms of research and digital data as well. Yeah, uh, so that's uh, complicated because the publisher that owns the copyright, if it's one of the big five traditional publishers, chances are no. Uh, uh, because, but, but because they own the copyright to it, they could decide tomorrow to make it an open textbook. They're just probably not going to. But there are cases where you know books that are out of print or where the author. Uh, you know, maybe uh, the book isn't selling very well, the author can request the copyright back to the book uh, and release it openly. There have been a number of, of, of cases of that. Actually, just a follow-on comment. I know some of the people at Rice, and they've been proactive about trying to get authors who have out of print copyrights to get them mm -hmm. from the publishers that put them on connections so that there's people that can use mm -hmm. On the educational materials thing, I've been following this with some interest. Um, it seems there's a, a, a tricky facet. I was wondering if you could comment on. Uh, uh, I and some of my colleagues had NSF funding to develop an assessment instrument, mm -hmm. which we are happy to have open to any legitimate instructor, but have had some, some heartburn about the fact that, uh, that, depending on how this law is enforced, any student in the class who's using this assessment instrument, that's essentially a standardized test in the field, could legally request a copy and therefore negate its effectiveness of what the NSF wanted us to do. First place. Have you mm -hmm. thought about that? Or, or is there yeah. Call this place real, but it's policy very close. Yeah. So that that policy isn't in effect at, at NSF right now, uh, but it could be. Uh, and the way that that we talk about openness is what really our goal is to make openness the default. That we shouldn't be asking, you know, will you make this open? We should be asking, uh, why don't you want to make it open? And I think the, the, the question there would be, is there a legitimate reason why that assessment instrument shouldn't be open? And if there's you know, legitimate concerns about student getting access to it and potentially cheating or, or whatever the concern is, and you can justify that, then you know, of course. Some questions? There's obviously a lot of work that goes into uh, writing and authoring yep. uh, an open textbook. Um, looking at the market as a whole, uh, is there an issue with keeping the textbooks up to date? Mm -hmm. um, so, I mean, I know the textbooks that the students buy, there's new editions that come out every couple of years. Um, maybe not necessary in all cases, but I know I was listening to a faculty member here on campus who uh, wrote, authored a, an open textbook, and there was, she had some concerns mm -hmm. about how to keep that uh, textbook yeah, and there's no question that uh, sustainability is essential uh, for any model uh, for developing instructional materials. Uh, a number of the projects out there, like the book you're holding right now, uh, they've developed a business model around those books uh, where they actually do receive income that can go into keeping the books up to date. Uh, I think that uh, another point is that when things become digital, they're a lot easier to keep up to date rather than having to do massive print runs of books. Uh, uh, in order to change one typo. Uh, 
it's not as necessary to do that. Um, and a lot of the material can be actually from the outside world connected to the book, uh, really up to the minute. So uh, there's also the element of the instructor in the course. Uh, because you know what's current in your field and what um, your students should be learning about. It's actually an opportunity uh, for instructors to play a bigger role in making sure that the material their students need to learn uh, to stay, stay current um, can be included. So it's about, uh, there are different models, but developing communities of practice around specific textbooks or specific disciplines um, or sustainability models like that project that, that I mentioned. Uh, may I ask, how do you normally do that with traditional materials? Yep, so the examples of open textbooks I mentioned, the ones being published by the Oregon State University, by OpenStax, by a, a number of different projects, they actually go through that same process when developing their textbooks. Uh, so uh, the books are reviewed uh, in the same way that traditional books would be. So if you put your trust in the publisher um, to make sure that the material is up to date, uh, projects like that uh, will provide the same kind uh, of uh, assurance, I guess. Uh, but also, you know, at the end of the day, uh, you're really the people that know what's best for your students and uh, what kind of information uh, should be used in your classroom. So uh, there's also uh, a uh, making sure uh, uh, that you know, in your review of the material that it meets what you're looking for. Uh, but also having the opportunity when it doesn't meet what you're looking for uh, to actually make changes to it if you want to. Well, yeah, I mean, I think that's just the point, that open educational resources, they're set up to work legally the way that 20-year-olds are used to working with intellectual property, which is this idea of rip, mix, burn, share, copyright. <laughs> um, so OER already set up that way. So uh, I think that uh, open materials uh, are made for that kind of a world. And if the traditional en publishing industry ends up looking like uh, iTunes, that's great. It's affordable uh, and it's accessible for people and easy for them to use. I think our main contention is uh, how do we make sure that the textbook market, which is inherently built to be anti-consumer in a way that the music market is not, the music market is, you know, producers and consumers are on equal grounds, but in the textbook market, they're not. Um, so it's about coming up with a system to make sure that those prices uh, are affordable for the people that need to be able to access those materials. So if a system develops that, that people can access the materials for free, uh, great. 
Uh, but there's still questions about what is going to support uh, the teaching and learning practices five to eight years from now. Uh, and uh, what's, what's going to uh, really appeal to the next generation of students. So I think that uh, it's, it's uh, by far unclear what, what the market will look like, and our goal is to advocate for the best possible solution to set the bar high uh, so that um, whatever the market transforms into can be as best for students and teachers as possible.